Okay, so hi everybody, and excited to be here today. We're here in Mountain View with Michelle Gale, who's joined us to talk about the mindful parenting life in a messy world with her latest book that just came out. So we're very excited to have Michelle. A little bit about Michelle before we get started, and then she'll be able to tell us all about her messy world um, and also take questions for, for us. And hello out there on the live stream. Michelle is a mindfulness teacher and executive coach specializing in working with women, leaders, parents, and organizations interesting in awareness-based practices. She was previously the head of learning and leadership development at Twitter and spent her career working in high growth startups. Michelle serves on the board of the Holistic Life Foundation and is an advisor to the Wisdom 2.0 Conference and the Mindful Schools. She has studied mindfulness education with Mark Coleman, Jack Cornfield, Tara Brock, and the Search Inside Yourself Leadership Institute. Hello. So thank you very much, Michelle. And without further ado, I'll hand it over to you. Thank you. All right. Give it up for Michelle. Woohoo! We're here. Hi, everyone, and hello to the people on the live stream as well. Um, the last 24 hours of my life have been really messy. And <laughs> I'm assuming we have a room full of parents, or mostly parents. And so you did it. You're here. I, you can cr congratulate me as well. <laughs> I feel like it was amazing that I got here. And, and it, it's a lot as a parent just to kind of get to where you need to go. So I'm giving you a deep bow just for being in this room. And being that this, we're going to be talking about mindfulness, why don't we just take just a moment of pause. I love we have the G pause sign up here. So you don't have to change anything. You don't have to do anything. Eyes open, eyes closed. Just kind of following your breath a couple of times. Breathing in and breathing out and breathing in, breathing out. And one more time, breathing in. Breathing out. Yeah. Now we're here just a little bit more. I am too. So I hear all great presentations start with a story. That's what people tell me. So that's what I'm going to start with. So this is a picture. My son Brody is the one in the hoodie. He's 11. This picture wasn't taken that long ago. And um, he had a few friends at our house. And one of the boys, one of the other boys, started talking about a tragedy that happened in his family many, many years ago. But it was a pretty intense tragedy. And the other two boys listened intently, really listened. They were asking some questions. And there was a real gravitas to what was going on in the room. And I was just <laughs> in the kitchen, kind of hanging back, just observing and watching and kind of taking it all in. And all at once, Brody, my little guy, said, I know what we need to do. We need to have a compassion circle. <laughs> and so he took them. And one of the kids said, well, I've never done this before. Brody said, don't worry about it. I'll, I'll tell you what to do. <laughs> he knows what to do. I'm feeling very proud. Now, that every parent, I'm going to tell you these two stories about my kids. They're, these are like the best ones. <laughs> so, you know, this isn't like life every day. Let's make that clear, right? <laughs> make that clear right now. Um, but this was a good one. So he walked them through all sharing about, you know, about what was just said and sending good wishes to this past place. And they were in the circle for a couple of minutes. And then, you know, they went on their evening. They kind of unlocked hands and they were going on a night walk with flashlights and and off they went but I was re I, of course as the mama I mean I was a little teary-eyed <laughs> and a little stunned I mean he's done things similar to this but not quite you know he knew what to do right in that moment he'd had the practices in him enough through me and I didn't teach him to go do compassion circles he just had had the sense to pause and to stop and to check in so one more story. This is my son Tyler, again, not taken that long ago. And he's an athlete. He is extremely active. He has two speeds, you know, full speed, <laughs> no speed. And he's had a lot of injuries in his very short life. And he was subbing in a basketball game with a friend of his. He wasn't even supposed to be playing in the game. He actually was there just to watch. And they were short a player because it was winter break. 
And so they asked him to play, which he did. I wasn't even there. I had no idea he was playing basketball. And I get a phone call that he had gotten pushed and shoved and fell, and his best friend kicked him, broke his collarbone, <laughs> trying to keep the ball in. But, you know, 40 seconds left to the game. So he was in an incredible amount of pain. The paramedics came and got him. We ended up in the hospital, of course. On one side of us in the hospital was a meth addict who's had an infection and was not very present. <laughs> and on the other side was a man who'd been brought in and very rare, apparently, I found out later in the emergency room. The trauma unit was there trying to keep him alive. And he did not stay alive right next to us. So Tyler experienced that. And we kind of paused together when we realized this man had passed and sent him good wishes and put our hands on his heart. He was in an incredible amount of pain. Apparently the collarbone is only second to the spine to break. Mm. So we got home, very difficult to get him in the car, to get him home, to get him slowly down on the bed. I had to help him go to the bathroom. I mean, he couldn't do anything for himself. And when I finally got him settled, here's the, here's the moment. He's like, Mom, I'm getting to have the experience of what it's like to be disabled. I said, you are, you are. And he said, you're getting to see what it's like to be a disabled, to take care of a disabled child. I said, you're right, I am. And then, I'm going to try not to get weepy, he said, you know, I'm going to have a lot more compassion for disabled people moving forward. And again, you know, I'm stunned. And I got teary-eyed with him. And he said, why are you crying? Of course, he's 14. <laughs> like, why are you crying? And I tried to explain to him in the best language I could how remarkable it was that in the greatest pain of his life, for sure, he's never been in this kind of pain, the darkest, one of the darkest moments of his life, he knows he's not going to play sports for a few months, that you were able to find the learning and the beauty in this mess that you're in. And I told him, most adults <laughs> don't, don't get there in a lifetime, in a lifetime, right? To be in that space and to see the potential and to see the positivity, right? So I love this image because we learn the most and we have the most opportunities to awaken and to find our mindfulness and to find our compassion in the most difficult parts of our lives, right? In the cracks, in the darkness. This is where, this is where the opportunity is. But we don't like that, <laughs> right? right? When things go wrong, we want to push it away. You know, we want to push away the unpleasant and we want to hang on to the pleasant. And that's normal. That's what we do as human beings. And this is where these beautiful practices that I guess I'm assuming I'm preaching to the choir in this room and on the live stream, that mindfulness and compassion is important to you. And this is what these practices offer us, that we can start to hold the pleasant and the unpleasant, the, you know, the dark and the light, the beauty and the yuck <laughs> in our lives at the same time and be able to see clearly. Well, I love this quote that I think goes so well with what I just shared by Rumi. Don't turn away, keep your gaze on the bandaged places. That's where the light enters you. And that's really just what happened to my son Tyler and to my son Brody during the time that there was, they were sitting in darkness. And it was in this wounded place that the light entered both of them. And, and we can all have those, those experiences, and we probably all have had them. Certainly when you ask people, what is the greatest learning of your life? You know, tell me about the time that you learned the most about yourself. Very few people will point to something fantastic. They weren't at Disney World. <laughs> you know, they weren't like dan out dancing. Usually it's something heavy, right? It's a sickness. It's an illness. It's a death. It's one of those things that brings us to those those heavier places. So I'm not trying to be depressing. We'll lighten up a little bit. Um, and I love this quote as well by Rumi. The cure for the pain is in the pain. 
right? So we want to dive in. We want to go deep. We want to be willing to go in and dive deep. You know, in the last 24 hours, uh, my youngest son, Brody, the compassion, the compassion man, had a really hard time. He has a lot of learning differences. School is a struggle. We've changed schools almost every year. He's been having a really hard time, and he had the meltdown of meltdowns yesterday. And it took everything in me to sit with him and find compassion. It was really, really hard. But I knew the cure for the pain was in the pain. And I knew my job was to sit with him, just like I did year after year when he was very young and we didn't understand why. Always having a temper tantrum, always on the floor. We didn't understand. We didn't know at that time what was going on. And he's a wonderful kid, super creative, nonlinear, um, but a lot of barriers to learning. And, and when he was younger, that was my practice, to sit with him as the temper tantrum went on and to sit with him and to let him know, I will hold this with you. And that was what I tried to offer him yesterday and that was what my husband tried to offer him yesterday. We will hold this with you. We are willing to sit in this pain with you, this messiness, and hold this with you. And there's light in here as well that you can't see right now. Right? Mindful parenting in a messy world. That's why I named the book what I did. So what gets in our way? You know, what gets in our way? This tree is on the ground. <laughs> what we want is to be that, that redwood tree standing tall. You've probably heard that image, you know, of the redwood. The wind comes, the storm comes, it kind of blows over, but then it comes back up. And I like to add that, I didn't always know this, but redwood trees have very, d not deep roots, you know, very shallow roots, but they're connected to community around each other. They're connected to family around each other. And I think that's a beautiful metaphor for the parenting journey, is that this is, this is what we do at home as a family, no matter what that family looks like. We have shallow roots that we're all hanging on to, sometimes for dear life. <laughs> but we're all hanging on to those roots together. And that was what we were trying to be with my son yesterday. And this is, this is what I think is the big <laughs> aha for me. I've been noodling on this statement for a while. Everything's fine until it isn't, and then it is again. And I actually wrote a blog post about it not too long ago um, when I was in traveling over the holidays. And this, this is what gets in our way, because everything's fine, and then it isn't, and then it is. And we don't like it when it's not. When it's not, we believe something's wrong. Yeah? And if we're always believing something's wrong when it's not, okay, <laughs> then we're never going to have those opportunities to find the light in the crack, right? We need to be okay with our not okayness because let's face it, how many parents in here? Parents, raise your hand. So pretty much everybody, almost everyone. Parenting is hard, it's not easy. You know, I've been focused on these practices and working on myself and doing inquiry and sitting on my cushion and going through trainings and teaching and and I still have a hard time right parenting is hard it's not easy it's not meant to be easy and we're meant to fall and then get back up so here is what happens the movies right we all have this movie in our mind of how things are supposed to be We've all had this experience, right? We're going to someplace special with our family and we've been thinking about it and we have it in our mind and the movie and what it's gonna be like. And then we get there <laughs> and nothing goes the way we planned and the movie's not matching reality and what happens? <laughs> right? We go downhill. We, we kind of sab we'll self sabotage. We'll sabotage our experience. So, what mindfulness gives us, and I'm sure you've had this experience, is to see the movie, right? We see the movie playing yesterday, all day, with my son. I saw the movie. It's not supposed to be this hard, right? That's what I'm telling myself. I'm seeing the images of him calm and going to school every day and not calling and <laughs> the nurse not calling me. And, you know, I have this movie of what it's supposed to be like but I don't buy it. I don't buy it. And when we have our mindfulness, we don't buy it, right? And I love the image of mindfulness. You know, this is something that happens, like 
something that we assume is, that we consider is not good in some way. And then there's our reaction. And we don't have our mindfulness. These two things are right next to each other. There's the bad thing, and then there's our reaction. And when we have our mindfulness and we have our compassion, you know, this space opens up. And we've all had that experience of, oh, this time there was a little bit of space. And I was able to make a different choice and make a different decision. And in family life, we want to be watching those movies. What is the story? What is the story that you tell yourself about your children? What's the story that you tell yourself about your relationship to your children? And does it match? It's an exploration. There's no one answer. But I encourage you to journal. Journal on those stories. What are they? What are the stories that you hold true? about your family. I have one about my two boys that they're supposed to be super close, <laughs> right? Aren't brothers supposed to be super close? My husband and I had two kids to live vicariously through siblings because we're both only children. <laughs> so we wanted to see what it was like, right? That was our first mistake, <laughs> that we had this movie in our mind. Oh, we get to see siblings. Well, they are, couldn't be any more opposite in the world, and they don't like each other that much is the truth. <laughs> you know, they have moments, and so I've learned to just <gasps> take those moments for what they are and, and, and just keep planting those seeds of love and connection between the two of them. But the movie is not working out <laughs> the way that I planned. And, and I work on being okay with that not being okay, because it's hard. It's hard. So this is, these are all pictures of my family, and we're happy, and we're <laughs> smiling, and we're connected, right? So what do you think, what could you imagine all of these pictures have in common? We're on vacation. <laughs> and the other thing that all of these pictures have in common is that there was fighting beforehand. <laughs> Not long before, just a little while before, there was arguing and bickering and, ah. Uh, the day from the beach photo that you're seeing, that full day was what I wrote this blog post about. You know, and, and things happen. Like in the morning, I woke up and I sat. I did my little meditation. We were on the water. I'm like, oh, this is such a good moment. You know, I love this moment. And then my, my older son, who's an adolescent now, woke up and kind of came into the room like, mm. you know, it was kind of a grunt <laughs> happened. And I was like, hmm. That's not such a good moment. I would, I would have preferred that had been different. And then my son, my two kids were sitting on the couch reading, not engaged, but somewhat close to each other, both reading very peacefully. I'm like, oh, see, this is so nice. <laughs> this is a nice moment. And then it was time to leave, and there was an argument of who was going to sit in the front, and so that big argument happened. And I didn't like that moment. I'm like, oh, not OK. This is not OK. And then we're on the way there, and 90s hip hop playing and we're all singing in the car. I'm like, oh, see, we're a nice, normal family. Look at us <laughs> having a good time <laughs> listening to music. And then it's time to stop somewhere to get some food before we go to where we're going. And no one can agree on the food, and everyone's got food allergies anyway. And my husband storms out. He's just for three cafes to get food. I'm like, it's just lunch. Why does it have to be this hard? Right? And then there we are on the beach. <laughs> Not long after. But that's the way of it, right? That is the way of it. That's just parenting. That's just family life. And it's very easy, and I know you have all thought, God, it's a really rough day, right? It's a really rough day. But if we look at the moments, like the moment by moment by moment, it's kind of like when you're sitting in meditation, and sometimes it's peaceful, and you know, you can kind of ease into it, and then the mind goes wild, and you're just kind of trying to figure out where you're going and hang on, and, and then you kind of settle again, right? It's up and it's down, and that's just the way of it. So those are the pictures you didn't see, right? You didn't, I didn't put those pictures on, <laughs> on, on Instagram or anywhere, you know? I didn't talk about how we were arguing, right? I might tell my friends. But we don't see that, right? We don't see that out in social media land. We, we keep that to ourselves. So, you know, all of these emotions come through. We've got the, the anger, right? Anger comes. And 
we're not happy. Like, we're not supposed to be angry. Anger is not okay. And the fear comes, and I don't want to be afraid. Or we don't even realize we're afraid. We're just reacting from afraid. And then shame comes, right? That Mac Daddy emotion that dysregulates everything else. And there's the shame that I snapped and I raised my voice, right? And what if you knew that even after all these practices, I still raise my voice? I've been trying not to yell for 10 years. And I do it less, <laughs> but I still do it. And then it happens, and immediately the shame comes. But I have to know it's there. I have to be aware of the shame. Right? This is the gift. There's got to be a little space. So I see the shame. And what if you knew, right? What if, what if you knew how mean my kids were to each other and how angry that made me sometime? You know, and what if you knew I was terrified? I'm terrified that my kids won't be friends when they grow up, that they're not going to be close that they're going to have two separate lives. That really scares me. But what we know is that awareness is like the sun. When it shines on things, they are transformed. Right? The wise Thich Nhat Hanh. And so just even what I did right here with you, right, the, the uber vulnerability, standing in front of a room of people and sharing, all those things are true that I shared with you. I'm not making them up. When we shine a light on the shame and the fear right, and the anger, something happens. It's like when we're sitting in meditation and we're thinking, 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 and then we notice the thought, right? That's our practice. We notice the thought like a bubble, poof, gone, right? We shine the light of awareness on it. And then we feel like this, <laughs> we're like, Whoa. you know, I, I'm aware, I'm awake. And we do that moment by moment by moment. And we do it, and we teach our children to do it. And we don't teach them to do it by telling them how to do it. We, I teach my children to do that by saying out loud what's going on for me. Right? So I'm, say I'm in the kitchen, and everybody's having a hard time, and I'm finding myself really irritated. I might say, I'm really irritated. Like I'm noticing, like my jaw is tight, my stomach feels a little sick, my heart feels a little tight, my chest area feels a little tight. I need a break. I'm about to say something I don't want to say. So I'm going to go away, and I'm going to come back. I'm going to go away. I'm going to breathe a little bit. I'm going to get a little space, and I'm going to come back. I don't do that every time. Sometimes I blow it, right? and I <laughs> say something I wish I hadn't said, and then I have to repair. But the repair is just <coughs> as good. The repair is just as good as catching it, sharing it, making it explicit. Right? If, we are, if we as parents are practicing, and waking up and becoming more conscious, and we're saying it out loud, we're, we're giving them this experience to voice, then they learn how to do it. They learn. So how? How do we do this as parents? And many of you may already practice, but I have something to offer. So here we are, right? This is kind of what our lives often look like. We're falling asleep at our desk. We're just spent, right? We're completely spent. We're trying to get bills paid. We're trying to get work done. And it's just hard. It's hard to make it all happen. So how do we do it? How do we do it in the course of a day? Because this is how I often feel. I'm like, come on. Come on, inner peace. You know, I, I don't have all day. <laughs> but we know that's impossible, right? Sometimes I'm like, why couldn't I just be one of those people that's born somewhere and just live in a cave? <laughs> and this just would have happened. Because that's just not, it's not the lives we're living, right? We, everyone here in this room, we're all working parents. And we have to weave it in to what we're already doing. And this is good news. To experience peace does not mean that your life is always blissful. It means that you are capable of tapping into a blissful state of mind, <coughs> admit amidst the normal chaos of a hectic life. And Jill Bolte Taylor wrote the book Stroke of Genius, if you've never read that. It's a wonderful book. And I love this quote. I'm like, oh, whew. <laughs> you know, we just have to be able to tap into it and just touch, touch, touch. You know, we can have hard days. We will have hard days. I, I don't think you could be a parent and not have a hard day, whether you have one or two or three. So we can 
we can play. I, I love these images because for me, they all point to things that I try to do in my day. I, I took on a practice not long ago. Like how many times have we heard our kids be like, will you play with me? Will you play with me? And what's often the answer? I can't, or I'm busy, or I'm making dinner, right? And I was hearing that, right? My mindfulness practice helped me hear like, oh my gosh, I say that so many times. And so I committed to saying yes for one week just to see how it would go. Every time, now this was not when they were three. So it might be a little different. <laughs> so you might have to say like, I'll give myself 10 times or something. I'm not, I'm, this happened when they were a little older, so it wasn't happening like 10 times a day. Um, <laughs> but I said yes. I started saying yes. And it was the best little research study I ever did inside of my family. We had the sweetest week. So I kept it going. And I can't always say yes. Sometimes I have to say no. But I've learned to say yes more than I say yeah, no. Yes, I'll jump on the trampoline. I mean, jumping on the trampoline is super fun. <laughs> <laughs> there are some really fun games you can play on the trampoline. You know, yes to the card game. You know, yes to the sword fight. Yes. And it might be that we're just walking down a busy road, right? It's a great time to practice. Walking from here to your next meeting or back to your desk. What if it was just a mindful walk? What if you were just really paying attention to your feet hitting the ground and that was it? or just following your breath, or just even like feeling your hands swing from here to wherever you're going next. And you know, when our kids are having a hard time, can we really just pause? Can we just stop? Can we listen? And dinner time's such a good one. You know, dinner times, we, we don't eat dinner together every night <laughs> by any stretch of the imagination, although I would love to, but it feels almost impossible at my house. But when we do, and we do as often as we can. We hold hands and we do this little hand squeeze that goes around. And, and it's this sweet moment of connection. Or we can be thankful for how the food got to us. Right? The farmer that planted it and the person that tended it and the truck driver that came and picked it up and brought it to the grocery store and the grocery store person who took it out of the truck and the person who put it so beautifully out in the grocery store or to the farmer's market, and mom or dad who went and got it and brought it home and cooked it, and wow, we can be grateful. We have a gratitude jar on our, in our kitchen. It's actually a little too big. I need to get a little bit of a smaller one, but it's, it's a big gratitude jar, and it says gratitude jar on it, and I keep paper and pen right next to it, and you know, we'll just go through practices of every morning or at night or if we have friends over, just writing a gratitude and putting it in, right? That pause, just that moment. So we build it into what we're already doing. We pause. Right? We just press the pause button throughout the day. And so dedicated practice that you're seeing more in these images are important and research tells us that you know retreat practice and regular dedicated practice is very supportive for our well-being and for our for our brains and as parents we all know that dedicated practice where we stop for 20 minutes 30 minutes go away for a day go away for a few days is not always possible you know when i started practicing about Ten years ago, regularly, I was introduced in college when I was having a really hard time. I went to a Unity church and sat every Sunday there. And so that was my introduction to guided meditation. But I didn't start practicing regularly until I had a four-year-old and a six-month-old. That was when I entered practice. So I had to be really creative of how I practiced. And I remember one of my teachers, I was complaining to one of my teachers, I can never get into my meditation practice and it just never happens and I was all grumpy about it. And she said, well, tell me a little bit about your day. So I'm telling her about my day and I get to the end of the day. I'm like, and they always made me stay in their room at night and I have to stay there until they fall asleep. <laughs> and, then, and then I'm too tired to practice. And you know, you know what's coming next. She's like, why don't you just sit in their room? don't I just sit in their room? So I put a cushion in their room and we made this agreement that as they were falling asleep at night, I would stay in their room, I would sit, 
and I would do my meditation. I'd cuddle with them first and do our little rituals. And then I would sit and I'd say, I'm not leaving until way after you're asleep. I'm doing my practice in here. And I did that for years when they were really little. Right? So what are the things that you're already doing that you can weave integrated practice that we're talking about walking to the office or walking down the street or dedicated practice that you can even do in, in one of your kids' rooms if they're super young and let you in. If they're teenagers, they might not let you in. I'm no longer allowed in at night. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, we start where we are, wherever we are, wherever we are, we can have a moment of practice. And you all saw, as soon as we came in, we took a few breaths, right? everything shifts. Everything shifts. No matter how busy we are or busy our mind goes, just a few breaths brings us back. So I'm just going to run through some of my favorite <coughs> ways of weaving it into to my day or things I like to share. I, mornings are so wonderful and you don't have to get out of bed. You know, I've done a lot of practice with John Kabat-Zinn and he always says, lay there, Shavasana pose. Just open your eyes so you're not too sleepy. If you can close your eyes and not fall back asleep, that's fine. But when you wake up in the morning, just lay there and follow your breath. Do a body scan. You don't even have to get out of bed. I will often also get up and sit on my pillow with my husband there, and I'll just sit and close my eyes until someone comes to bother me. And I practice not being annoyed that I got interrupted from my meditation. <laughs> <laughs> my, my bell didn't go off yet. <laughs> I'm not done. Oh, I'm done. You know? <laughs> it's over. I'm definitely done. The shower, right? I've done a lot of executive coaching, and I can't tell you how many times you've heard this. I have the best ideas in the shower. Why do we have the best ideas in the shower? We've paused. You know, we're, we're in sensation when we're in the shower. The mind quiets. So what if we did that intentionally when we got in the shower, and we just felt the hot water on our body, and we just allowed ourselves to be there in the shower? One of my favorites, I love my cup of tea in the morning. I'm a big fan of Earl Grey tea. And usually it gets pushed off and gets pushed off. I boil the water and my husband's like, the water's boiling again. I'm like, I know, but I still haven't made my tea. Like, I'm dying to make my tea, but I keep getting interrupted. And then there's that moment. To me, it's one of the magical moments of my day that I stop and I just put my hands on the cup and I smell it. And I just give myself 30 seconds or a minute to just enjoy the heat of the water. I love this image. I, when I saw this image, I thought, oh, what a great practice. So I tried it, and it sounds a little hokey, but it works. Every time, for one day I tried it, and then I continued it. Every day, I, every time I caught a glimpse of myself in the mirror or in my computer, I would say something kind to myself. I would send myself some kindness. Like, you're, depending on the day, right, it might have been, you're doing the best you can. You know, I love you. Whatever it might be, I'd send myself some kindness. And mindful listening. You know, I kind of mentioned that a little bit earlier, but if you've practiced mindful listening, it's just that stopping and noticing any thoughts that are in your mind when someone's talking. Are you trying to respond? Or are you really, really gifting your presence? And with our children, particularly any older besides me, teenagers in here, a few, a few teenagers, mindful listening for all of you that are on your way to teenagehood. <laughs> it's so critical. And the car, right, they get out of school, they get in the car, what do most of us do from the time they're little? How was your day? What happened? You know, how was your test? <laughs> you know, we start pummeling them with all these questions and they what? Often, they shut down. Even little ones will. Sometimes, you know, little ones still want to tell you everything, but certainly as they get older, that's it. So I've learned, shh. You know, I pick them up and I just, shh, nothing. I just say, I'm happy to see you. I'm so happy to see you. That's it. And almost always the conversation will come and it's on his terms, not my terms. And so it arises. The car, use the car. And by the way, when they come to be teenagers, they sit in the back with their friends and for some reason you're not there. You get all kinds of good information <laughs> that you wouldn't have gotten. Like, how do you not know that I'm sitting right here? Yeah. <laughs> it's so great. And just, 
just shh, don't say anything. <laughs> and I love this image too. Sitting in the car, also drop-offs, pickups. Anybody have to drop your kids off or pick them up at an activity? Anybody? Yeah, lots of activities in the car. Beautiful place for dedicated practice. You know, I'd drop my kids off to jujitsu or baseball or wherever they were going, and I'd sit in the car for 5, 10, 15 minutes. Or at pickup, just sit in the car for 5, 10, 15 minutes. Use your insight timer, simple habit. By the way, on simple habit, I did a seven-day series for parents. It is five minutes a day. So if that's supportive, I'm not sure if it's free or not, but it is on Simple Habit. Headspace, right? Just put your earbuds in, sit in silence, get a guided meditation, just sit in the car. <coughs> oh. <laughs> and the smile, the smiles. We can really take in the smiles, right? The joy, we can bring the joy in more fully. So I really... I encourage you all to make a list. It doesn't have to be right now. But remember to make a list of what you do from the time you wake up in the morning till the time you go to bed at night. I'll do this with parents in workshops. And I'm doing a workshop here next week. Maybe we'll do that. Make that list and look and see where can you weave in a moment of mindfulness. I mean, be really specific. You know, wake up, <laughs> walk to the bathroom, you know, take my shower, make my tea, make lunch for my kids. Where can you weave in a moment of mindfulness? Because it really is, it's, you know, we've heard this, this phrase, it's like exercise, it's like building a muscle, right? We have to build that muscle, and so we have to practice over and over and over again. One of my teachers gave me a centering practice that I did 50, 60, 70, 80 times a day, depending on what my day <laughs> was like. I would do it more. My kids were very young. I couldn't get away to a retreat. In fact, I thought I was the biggest fraud meditation person because I'd never been on a retreat. And I was bemoaning this to one of my teachers. And they really stopped me in my tracks and said, no, Michelle, this is the gift. Right? This is what you're going to get to share. And this is what we all need to learn as parents, that just those moments again and again and again cultivates an awakened life. And that's what we all want. We want to live awake. We want to be mindful. So we can, we can feel the joys. It's not just so it's not just about, I like to say, it's not just about the sadness and it's not just about like dealing with the frustration and the pain and the anxiety, which it's so, so wonderful for. That's what brought me to practice. I have a lot of natural anxiety. I have it right now, and it's not because I'm nervous. I have it most of the time. My chest is tight. My belly's a little tight. I always kind of feel like I can't breathe in all the way. I was just born that way, and that was one of the things that brought me to practice. So it's wonderful for those things. And we can experience the joys even more, right? We can really smell the scent of our baby's hair when they first get out of the bath in the morning, right? We can watch them play and see them learning new things as they get older and just be in awe. Right? We want more moments of awe and practice brings us to awe. And it brings us to a fierce heart. And here is what I think is one of the most magical parts of practice for anyone, but particularly for parents. Because our heart is going to get broken over and over and over again. We're going to find our, you know, lives and our heart on the floor in a million pieces and, you know, from those movies, <laughs> those movies that weren't working out. And we're going to pick it up and we're going to put it back together. And each time we put it back together, it gets stronger. And the question we all have for ourselves is, can my heart remain open when, it, when things are hard? You know, can I, can I have that fierce, open heart. And it's okay that it's cracked. And it's okay that it's not perfect, right? We're not, we're not trying to perfect ourselves. <laughs> we're trying to perfect our love. And I have a story I'll read you. I think we have enough time. Um, I love this story. I, the first time I heard it was um, from Tara Brock. And it is from it's written by Richard Selzer. It's from Stories for the Heart, compiled by Alice Gray. And it's called The Kiss. 
I stand by the bed where a young woman lies, her face post-operative, her mouth twisted in palsy, clownish. A tiny twig of the facial nerve, the one to the muscles of her mouth, has been severed. She will be thus from now on. Nevertheless, to remove the tumor from her cheek, I had to cut the little nerve. Her young husband is in the room. He stands on the opposite side of the bed, and together they seem to dwell in the evening lamplight. Isolated from me, private. Who are they, I ask myself. He and this wry mouth I have made, who gaze at each other and touch each other so generously. Will my mouth always be like this, she asks. Yes, I say, it will be. It is because the nerve was cut. She nods and is silent, but the young man smiles. I like it, he says. It's kind of cute. All at once, I know who he is. I understand, and I lower my gaze. One is not bold in an encounter with God. Unmindful, he bends to kiss her crooked mouth, and I am so close I can see how he twists his own lips to accommodate her, to show her that their kiss still works. So can we show ourselves and can we show our children and our families over and over again each time you know, we take a downturn? Can we show them that it all still works? So when the anger appears, can we do that U-turn, right? Can we notice the anger, have that pause? Can we do the U-turn and come in and explore? Can we get curious? What is this anger? Where is it coming from? What's it about? Right? As soon you know, curiosity kills anger in a second. The second we get curious about it, there's, a, there's some space. And then we have the opportunity to do something a little more creative than we might have done <laughs> otherwise. And when the fear comes, right, we notice it, it arises. Can we stop, do the U-turn, and come in and notice, ah, this fear. Right? And John Kabat-Zinn often says, and this too. And this too, I can include all of this. And we get curious. And then the shame, right? Can we do the U-turn and see, what is this about? This shame, can I explore it? Can I understand it better? And then we give ourselves some self-compassion. I'm a student of Kristen Neff's work, if you haven't studied her. She was the, one of the original, really the original researcher on self-compassion. And she shares that what we, what we need to do when we're in these states of you know, really being hard on ourselves is to be mindful, to bring up our mindfulness, to realize that common humanity, right? We all go through this. Everyone in this room, if you look around, we've, we're all going through this together, that it can be hard and it can be beautiful and it can be miserable, and it can be fun, right? We're common humanity. This is your tribe, right? In this room, we're all connected by being parents. And then being kind to ourselves. And from the research, she says, you know, always put your hand on your heart. So when I was doing that little mirror exercise, I tried, if I wasn't in too strange of a place, to say something nice to myself, put in my heart, or just anywhere, you know, on my body, just to touch myself, let, my know, let myself know. Mm. You know, a little bit of kindness. This is reality for most people in this room, for most people who are listening <laughs> on the live stream. This is the reality. This is how it's going to be. It's going to be up, down, everything's fine until it isn't, then it is again. Right? Mindful parenting in a messy world. That's what we're living. And we can, we can respond more skillfully. Right? And that's what you hear over and over again when you learn about mindfulness. It's all in the choice, right? moving from that, we live this autopilot life, to get to choose what is my response going to be in this moment. Right? So we can choose kind of to go down those dark places. And sometimes we are going down the dark places. Last night, I was kind of pooped. You know, we'd been, I'd been kind of with my son for hours. And I, the compassion just wasn't coming, and my husband brought the light <laughs> for, for a little while. I didn't have any more light to give. <laughs> and that's okay. That's okay, right? And we're blessed if we have a partner, right, that we, can, that we can share that with. Not everyone does. But we can go 
to that side, or we can shine the light of awareness on the fear, on the shame, on whatever's going on for us. And I don't always get it right, but these guys and these faces keep me very motivated, and I'm sure you have your own faces in your phone. I wish I could see all of them. But this is why we, this is why we practice. We practice for ourselves, we practice for the world, and we practice for our families, and they are, you know, they will bring us to our knees in spiritual practice, <laughs> our children, right? They will trigger every un, <laughs> undealt with issue from childhood we have. And that's also their gift to us because they point us to our freedom. They point us to where the work needs to happen. And I am very grateful to be on this path with all of you in this room and everyone listening. Thank you. Yeah. Great. Thank you, Michelle. So we'll take questions. Anyone have a question in the room? Uh, I, hi, I'm Adson from Brazil. Okay. I'm very glad that I, I'm here just to, <laughs> to, to get your talk here. Thank you. Uh, at the same moment. So my, my point is about emotions. How you call or you teach somehow about emotions for your children? How do you teach them about emotions? Yeah, emotional intelligence, emotional but not this this kind of approach, a more like natural approach for this. Yeah, yeah. Um, got that. Um, well, one idea that I share with my kids is naming the emotion, right? And there's some wonderful research on this. Matthew Lieberman, I think in 2014, talked about just naming the emotion, how that clears the prefrontal cortex, calms the amygdala. So we teach them just to name it, you know, like, and, and I think that's in a lot of the parenting literature now. Oh, you're angry, right? Oh, you feel sad. And it might seem a little hokey, you know, to do that. We do it more often when they're young. Um, but we can also inquire with them when they're older, like, what is the emotion? And if you can, depending on your child, my kids are kind of used to it now, like, where is it in your body? Locate it. Is there a color? What does it feel like? Like, so they, what, what we want is for them to get to know their emotions, and the body is where they live. Right? We experience them in the body long before they come into cognition. And another little trick with emotions that I also like to share is time them. So when they were really little and they'd say, I'm so angry, I'm like, wow, you're really angry. Let's see how long it lasts. How long can you be angry? <laughs> Right? And put on the timer. Let's see how long you can be angry. And now it's a game, right? So now it'll pass quickly. But, you know, because now they want to see how long it can pass. But, you know, within 60 <laughs> seconds or a minute, you know, it's gone. And so they see, oh. So what, what we're teaching them is it comes and it goes. It begins and it ends. Have you ever been angry all day? I'll ask them. <laughs> well, no, not really. It's usually not that way. It's usually not that way. So is that helpful? Anybody else? Hold on one second. Let me oh. get the mic. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for being here and sharing your story. So yeah. quick question. Like you mentioned, there is, let's say, structured practice that you sit and meditate, and there's being mindful during, during the day, yeah. and then you mentioned a lot of different ways how to teach the latter one. Have you ever tried to do like a structured practice, meaning let's sit down together and have a meditation session with your kids? With my kids. Yes. Well, I, the way I came to teaching meditation was actually I went through the Mindful Schools program because I, I wanted to teach it to my kids at home. And I ended up teaching in their school. <laughs> so I taught in their school as a volunteer for three years. So they got it from me there. And I found, at least for me anyway, at home to actually try to explicitly teach it. Most kids won't. Most kids won't. I let them see me, right? So if they come in my room and I'm sitting, right? I love John Kabat-Zinn tells the story of, you know, his son, Will Kabat-Zinn, is a, a mindfulness teacher in his own right, at Spirit Rock and all around. And, um, and he would say, he'd be sitting, he, John got up very early to sit, four in the morning all the time, you know, did his whole yoga and, and meditation. And he says he never, ever asked his kids to sit in meditation. But they'd come in and they'd see him sitting and he'd have a blanket around and he said he'd open the blanket, you know, and they'd come in. And he closed the blanket, and that image to me is so beautiful. And then they just sit there with him in meditation. So depending on your child, some kids will eat it up. Books are a really great way. There's so many moody cow meditates, I think it's called. And I mean, there's a whole bunch of beautiful children's books. 
And so reading, I, we did a lot of reading, but explicit teaching, I think it's in the weaving in. I think it's in the pausing. Before my kids used to go to school um, when they were younger, they started walking alone and I was all freaked out. I'm like, oh, so weird. Like they're leaving without me and I don't like it. And, <laughs> and so for me, this was a me practice. I'm like, would you guys be willing to just hold hands, you know, do our little circle like we do at dinner and do a little hand squeeze and take one breath? Like, okay, you know, they were willing to do it. And then they, if I forgot, they would ask for it. So that probably went on for three or four months. You know, every morning before they left for school, one breath. So my encouragement is to weave it in. And if you have a child that is really excited to learn, then go for it. Yeah. I have a question. Yeah. So tantrums, what's the mindful response? What would be a best practice if you've just got someone who's tantruming a lot? Yeah. Or big time. Yeah. Well, I think, you know, there's a few layers to that. There's always like what's under the tantrum, right? So that's always where from a mindfulness perspective, right? Where it's never the behavior, right? It's always there's some emotional reaction. And what is the emotion? And what is, you know, nonviolent communication, very nonviolent communication. What's the need that's not being met? You know, and I love, I think Dan Siegel does halt, hungry, halt, angry, lonely, tired. You know, you can ask yourself, hungry, angry, lonely, tired. So to know what's under it, what's causing it. And if you can get them to share, wonderful, some in the middle of a tantrum, not always, but then it's being able, like I was saying earlier, to hold it. So they know I can hold this with you. You're not alone in this. We can be in this together. And just that alone, trying to stop it is, you know, unless, you know, sometimes you're in the middle of a store and you're like, how about a Twizzler, you know? <laughs> and that works and that's just, sometimes it's just survival. But if you've got space and time, hold it. Great, yeah. well, That's thank it. you so much. I think we're at time. Thank Thanks you so everybody. much, Michelle. Thank you.